Well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. It's good to see all of you this morning. If, if you're new here, um, we're kind of new too. So for those of you who don't know who I am, my name's Aaron, and my wife and I, Cheyenne, and our four kids, we moved here about four months ago, and now we have the joy of serving here. Uh, part of the team here at Wellspring is a teaching pastor. It's so good to see all of you uh, this morning. Uh, we're in a kind of a fairly long series through the life of Joseph, including today. We have today and then the next two weeks, three more Sundays here as we finish up Joseph before we head into the Psalms this summer. So really excited just to continue on in this series, learning how God is working in and through the life of Joseph and how that speaks into uh, our very lives uh, in, in our day. It's just been a ton of fun to do that uh, with you uh, together. One thing I want to do just as we start here, just tell a little story here about something that happened for uh, my wife and I a few weeks ago. We got a chance to, number one, we got a babysitter which is like, that's a win, right? So being new to an area, so we're moving along, making some friendships there. So we got a babysitter and we were actually able to, we had some friends invite us to go to the Orpheum a Theater downtown and watch Frozen. And my goodness, what an incredible performance. I mean, I was, didn't really know what to expect, kind of first time to anything like this in a, in a number of years and was just completely blown away by like, I don't know how they moved the sets and the lighting and just the acting was phenomenal. And one thing that really stood out to both my wife and I was the performance of that famous song, Let It Go, by Elsa, right? You all probably know it. Just an incredible performance. But there's something about that song that I think we should pay attention to. And actually, one of my favorite authors and writers, Tim Keller, helps us out here. He says this. The song is sung by a character determined no longer to be the, quote, good girl that her family and society had wanted her to be. Instead, she would let go and express what she had been holding back inside. There's no right or wrong, no rules for her. This is a good example of expressive individualism. Identity is not realized in traditional societies by subliminating our individual desires for the good of our family and people. Instead, we become ourselves only by asserting our individual desires against society, by expressing our feelings and fulfilling our dreams, regardless of what anyone says. Now, it's not that Frozen is bad, <laughs> but I just want to point out how pervasive expressive individualism is in our culture. I mean, this is one of the most dominant assumptions that... We just swim in in our cultural moment. The assumption that the individual is at the center, that the self is sovereign, and that the only thing that fundamentally matters for our human existence is what you think you feel and what you think you can go ahead and just simply do. This is the cultural waters that we are swimming in. And while expressive individualism might sound freeing, I mean, the promise of it sounds amazing on one level, take it a few layers deeper... I would say it's one of the most burdensome and most isolating ways to live. Christopher Walken wrote a new book recently, and in it he writes this, In a world that catechizes us into a dream that you can be anything you want to be, we are faced with the twin responsibility of first choosing what to be and then becoming what we've chosen. We have to first decide what we want to be. There's a burden there, and then we have that responsibility to follow through on that. Now go become that thing that you've chosen. And this, I would say, is an incredibly isolating way to live. Just this past week, the United States Surgeon General announced that we in America are in another epidemic. Not an epidemic with a virus, thank God but an epidemic of loneliness. I don't know if you saw this on your news feed, but a report came out, a full 82-page report came out and said that nearly half of adults in America experience loneliness on a continual basis. And as a part of that report, showed that for one of the most recent times in U.S. history, one of the, for most recent history right now in America, Americans experience less social connection than they have ever before. And that there's massive physical and emotional and mental health consequences because of this. And by the end of the report, 
It just speaks to the fact that we as individuals are designed to be a part of something bigger than ourselves. So in a culture that on one hand champions individualism, yet is increasingly more and more lonely, is there a better way to live? You know, in a cultural moment where the sovereign self is continually more isolated, the Bible can seem strange and distant to us. And one of the reasons why the Bible might seem strange or distant to us in our cultural moment is because the Bible confronts and turns on its head the assumptions of our culture. And Genesis 48 is a prime example. Genesis 48 confronts one of the assumptions of our culture, individualism, and offers and points to something we all long and desire deep down that we all long for the Father's blessing. See, in this story that we heard just read, Jacob the father blesses his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh. And as Jacob the father blesses his two grandsons, Ephraim and Manasseh, there's a few things happening. The father's blessing to Ephraim and Manasseh does three things. It gives Ephraim and Manasseh, number one, a new story, number two, a new future, and number three, a new vision. So what I want to do this morning is kind of walk us through these things as we take a look here at how the fatherly blessing of Jacob gives Ephraim and Manasseh these three things. So number one, a new story. Take a look at the text. Verse one. After this, Joseph was told, behold, your father is ill. So he took with him two sons, Manasseh and Ephraim, and it was told to Jacob, your son Joseph has come to you. Then Israel summoned his strength and sat up in bed. And Jacob said to Joseph, God Almighty appeared to me at Luz in the land of Canaan and blessed me and said to me, behold, I will make you fruitful and multiply you and I will make you a company of peoples and will give you this land to your offspring after you for an everlasting possession. Now think about what we know thus far about Manasseh and Ephraim. It's not much, but think about what little we do know. First, Manasseh and Ephraim were first introduced to us back in Genesis 41. This is kind of towards the end of that chapter, they were born to Joseph at the moment in Joseph's own story when he was began to rise to power in Egypt. And if you think about it, Manasseh and Ephraim, up until this point in the story, All they've known is Egypt. All they've known is Joseph in this position of power in Egypt. At least from the text, what what we know and read, they don't know about Jacob. They don't know about the other brothers. They don't know about anything that's happened before. They were just raised in this Egyptian culture. But here in this moment in Genesis 48, Jacob does something very profound. Jacob goes back in his own story to then bring his grandsons into a much bigger story that they're now invited to be a part of. What do I mean? Well, think about it. Verse 3, Jacob says, God blessed me. And then verse 4, Jacob says, God said that I will make you fruitful and multiply. And that pairing of words or that pairing of phrases, blessing and fruitful and multiply, is something that we've come across multiple times, not only in the story of Joseph, but zoom out a little bit more all throughout the book of Genesis. Page 1 of your Bibles starts with God blessing the humans and telling them be fruitful and multiply. And so what Jacob is doing here in this moment in Genesis 48 is is taking not only Ephraim and Manasseh into Jacob's own personal story, reminding them of the promise that God gave to Jacob, but pulling Ephraim and Manasseh into this much bigger story that starts all the way back at creation, that starts all the way back at page one of the whole story, and telling Ephraim and Manasseh, The story that you've been a part of up until this point, the story in Egypt, is not your story any longer. You're part of a brand new story that the Father's blessing, Jacob's blessing, brings Ephraim and Manasseh from an old story into a new story. 
a story that is anchored in the covenant faithfulness and the covenant promises of God. Because that language, again, of blessing and be fruitful and multiply is kind of stock language all throughout, especially the book of Genesis, of how God is going to be faithful to his people and to his plan. So again, if you're Ephraim and Manasseh, welcome. Welcome to this new story. Why? Because of the Father's blessing. But this leads us to our second point. If the first thing that Jacob's fatherly blessing does is give this new story, number two, the fatherly blessing of Jacob gives Ephraim and Manasseh a new future. Take a look at verse 16. The text reads this, the angel, again this is Jacob speaking, who has redeemed me from all evil, bless the boys, and in them let my name be carried on, the name of my fathers, Abraham and Isaac, and let them grow into a multitude in the midst of the earth. See, in this moment, Jacob is saying that all the promises that first went to Abraham and then to Isaac and have been given to Jacob are now being passed on from generation to generation to these grandsons. Now, Ephraim and Manasseh, again, who have really up until this point in the story, have only experienced Egypt. But this fatherly blessing sets Ephraim and Manasseh up for a brand new future. A future that they were not expecting, but a future that's only becoming from the fatherly blessing of Jacob. And in many ways, this fatherly blessing is kind of like a prophecy of sorts. Because from here on out, Ephraim and Manasseh, yes, like I just mentioned, are part of this new story. But they have their place in God's future redemptive plan. That both Ephraim and Manasseh themselves and their descendants play a key role going forward into the future. Think about it like this. Let's kind of zoom in on each of these individuals for a moment and think about who, who comes from them. Ephraim first. Can you think of what famous Israelite leader comes from Ephraim's own line? Joshua. Joshua, who will take Israel into the promised land, is a descendant of Ephraim. And second, think about Manasseh. What famous kind of leader of Israel comes from Manasseh's line? Well, Gideon in the book of Judges. So both of these individuals are brought into this new story because of the Father's blessing. And because of the Father's blessing, have this brand new future where now their descendants take place in the storyline of God, into this brand new future of God. And because of the fatherly blessing, in addition to all that, Ephraim and Manasseh's future is secure. Ephraim and Manasseh's future have a secure place not only in God's plan, but also in God's promised land. It's because of the fatherly blessing that now every time you kind of keep reading through the Old Testament, what you're going to find is that actually, especially for Ephraim, that one of the main ways that the biblical authors summarize the 10 northern tribes is just with the stamp of Ephraim. So you'll read things in the prophets, for example, of Ephraim in the north and Judah to the south. And it's because of the fatherly blessing that these, these two men in particular and their descendants now have this brand new future that is secure. Again, why? Because of the fatherly blessing. But this leads us to our third point here, and perhaps one of the most confusing, at least on the outset. If the first thing is that the Father's blessing does is give Ephraim and Manasseh a new story, and second, gives them a new future, the third thing that we're going to see is that the fatherly blessing gives Ephraim and Manasseh a new vision. Take a look at verse 17 and following. The text reads this. When Joseph saw that his father laid his right hand on the head of Ephraim, it displeased him. And he took his father's hand to move it from Ephraim's head to Manasseh's head. And Joseph said to his father, not this way, my father, since this one is the firstborn. Put your right hand on his head. Verse 19, but his father refused and said, I know, my son, I know he also shall become a people and he also shall be great. Nevertheless, his younger brother shall be greater than he, and his offspring shall become a multitude of nations. 
So he blessed them that day, saying, By you, Israel, will pronounce blessings, saying, God make you as Ephraim and as Manasseh. Thus he put Ephraim before Manasseh. Then Israel said to Joseph, Behold, I am about to die, but God will be with you and will bring you again to the land of your fathers. Now, what's happening here? A couple things to notice is that, just first off, in the ancient world, it was very, very common for the firstborn to get all, or if not at least the majority of the fatherly blessing. I mean, this was the cultural assumption in Joseph's day, that if you were the firstborn, you were seen as the most important, and you were the one through whom the fatherly blessing would be given to But if you notice here in kind of the paragraph we just read and the whole chapter in particular, that something very different is happening. It's the younger that's being elevated to this position of firstborn. In addition, this is actually not unique to the book of Genesis. If you kind of rewind the tape a little bit, think about how God has been doing this pattern all throughout the book of Genesis. Abel over Cain. Isaac over Ishmael. And even Jacob over Esau. This is a fundamental, repeated pattern that has been happening all throughout the book of Genesis. And the question that we probably have, and that even some of the ancient readers would have had, is why? Like, why is this happening? Again, think about it. You live in a culture that just has as part of the assumptions of the day... That if you're the firstborn, you're the most important. And that's what it means to have power and prestige. But here, in God's story, in God's kingdom, things are different. The way that God does power, the way that God does position, the way that God does prestige is different in the biblical story than the cultural assumptions out there. And this at a fundamental level, is what the narrator of Genesis and what the Spirit is trying to help show and teach God's people. That the way power is done, the way that position is done, the way that all these things that the culture assumes to be the right way of doing things is often just completely upside down from our culture. And notice also that this is actually a surprise even for Joseph. Joseph. That Joseph himself is kind of like, hey, dad, what's up with this? Like, why are you switching the hands here? Why are you, like, doing this? This is not how it's supposed to be. Because Joseph himself has a little bit of the assumption going on. But here's Jacob at the end of his life where flaws and all, and we've talked about the flaws of Jacob, flaws and all, and all has come to a place where he is so in tune with the character of God, the purposes of God, and wants to spend his last few moments, his last few words imparting the wisdom and the way of God to the next generation. That the way that God does things is not going to be the way that our culture does things. And even in more particular, kind of double click on Ephraim for a little bit. Like, why is Ephraim the one being elevated? Like, again, there's an element of, like, this is how power is done in God's kingdom and not how the culture does, for sure. But even more so, think about the blessing that Jacob is passing on, the the fruitful and multiply blessing. And we were told at the end of the last chapter in Genesis 47 that God's people are experiencing that Eden-like fruitful and multiply blessing in Egypt. Well, Ephraim's name means doubly fruitful. He's the fruitful one. And so perhaps also what's happening is that this is kind of God's way through Jacob of reminding God's people that God will continue to allow his people to be fruitful, multiply, doubly so. And that it's kind of highlighting for the reader, highlighting for the listener. Look it. God is going to continue to expand his people, that they will continue to grow. And that Ephraim, the one who is doubly fruitful, God's people pay attention because God's going to do even more work in and through his people. That the promises, yes, have come from the generations past, but even what's going to happen into the future, perhaps the text is saying, might even be better, doubly fruitful or so. See, when we think about this passage, think about this. Can't we see that 
what the fatherly blessing is doing for Ephraim and Manasseh. Can't we see how the fatherly blessing is giving Ephraim and Manasseh a new story? Taking them out of Egypt and into the story and the promises of God, a new future, securing them and their identity and what's going to happen going forward, and a whole new vision, a whole new way of seeing the world, a whole new way of operating in the world. Can you see how the fatherly blessing is doing these things in Genesis 48? The question, though, is what does this mean for you and me? I mean, what is an ancient text with a fatherly blessing of switching of hands and all of that? What does that mean for you and me today? How can we get in on the fatherly blessing? How can we experience a new story, a new future, and a new vision? Well, think about it like this. Did you notice, and look at verse 15 if you can, notice that the blessing is actually given to Joseph. The text actually says Jacob blessed Joseph. Let me say it like this. Ephraim and Manasseh, yes, are being blessed, but the blessing is coming from the father through Joseph to Ephraim and Manasseh. And because Joseph is blessed, Ephraim and Manasseh are being caught up into the blessing of Joseph. In other words, Joseph is the mediator of the fatherly blessing. So how can you and me experience the fatherly blessing? This text points us to and reminds us of the greater mediator, the greater Joseph. Remember what 1 Timothy 2 reminds us of. It says this, For there is one God... And there is one mediator between God and men, the man, Christ Jesus. In and through the person and work of Jesus Christ, his life, his death, burial, resurrection, and ascension, we can receive and we have access to the fatherly blessing. And just like Ephraim and Manasseh received Jacob's blessing through Joseph, so too we, as God's people by faith, receive the fatherly blessing that's been given in and through the person of Jesus. Jesus is our mediator. Jesus is the one who gives us access to the Father's blessing. That what's true of Jesus is true of us. And like Ephraim and Manasseh, we too are caught up in a brand new story. Maybe you're here this morning and you kind of remember your past a little bit. And you can remember that for for many ways, you were once in proverbial Egypt. You were caught up in the cultural narratives of this world. But because of the fatherly blessing that's been given to us in and through Jesus, you're brought into a brand new story. A new story that is far better than the story of individualism of our day. A story where you don't have to create meaning for yourself. You don't have to create significance for yourself. But friend, meaning and significance in God's story, it's already given to you. It's a gift. And like Ephraim and Manasseh, because of the Father's blessing, you are brought into a whole new future. And and likewise, because of the work of Jesus, we receive the Father's blessing into a future that is secure, a future that is rock solid because of the work of Jesus. That the Bible reminds us that we are co-heirs with Christ. That right now, you and me as followers of Jesus are seated in heavenly places with Christ. That's our position. That's our standing. And that future is secure. That reality is secure. Why? Because of the finished work of Jesus. And that like Jesus, the Father has given Jesus the name that is above every name. So contrary to the story of individualism in our culture that says you have to go make a name for yourself, you have to perform, you have to achieve, you have to be something, even if you truly aren't that thing, no. The future that we have been given in and through the Father's blessing, our Heavenly Father, reminds us, reminds you that you don't have to make a name for yourself. Your name, your identity, Your future, that's a gift. It's been freely given to you. 
And likewise, when we see how Ephraim from Nassau have been given this new vision of reality, this new way of being in the world, likewise, because of the finished work of Christ, we are also given this new vision. This new vision of seeing how God works in the world. That Christ himself, who has all power and authority, takes on the lowly position for you and for me. And that likewise, we recognize, we see that we as Christians, we do power differently than the world. We do position and prestige and all those sorts of things differently because of what Christ has done for us. That we're not, contrary to the story of individualism, trying to one-up one another. We're not trying to be the best we can be and just kind of push the other person to the side. No, we're set free from all of that. We're set free to see how power is actually, the greatest power is to serve. The greatest power is to lay one's life down for someone else. And friends, this is only in and through understanding and believing the good news of what Christ has done for you and for me, giving us access, allowing us to receive this fatherly blessing. But friends, let me say this. It it actually doesn't stop there. There's actually more to the story. Because while it is fundamentally true that the blessing of the Father is mediated in and through the person of Jesus, the blessing is also passed on through humans, through people like you and me. I mean, in this story, the covenant promises that have been given from Abraham to Isaac to Jacob, it's very obvious, have been passed along through the generations, through humans, broken and flawed humans. And in the very same way, when we understand it and receive the blessing of the Father, that begins to change us, shape us, forms us into the kinds of people that begin to pass that story on, that begins to pass those promises on to the next generation. So if I may, I want to speak to two types of people in the room. First, let me speak to those who are maybe two, three, four, five decades older than me, if I can. A couple weeks ago, maybe a couple months ago now, I was scrolling through social media, kind of, you know, what you do. And yes, good things can come from social media every once in a while. And let me show you an example. This is a picture of a stack of Bibles, and not just any sort of random stack of Bibles, but a stack of Bibles from Pastor Ray Ortland. And if you don't know who Ray Ortland is, he's in his 70s. He's been serving Jesus faithfully for decades upon decades. And in the caption, this is an Instagram post he posted. In the caption, he writes about how each of these Bibles are his, and they've been Bibles he's had for numbers of years, and he's written in them, highlighted in them, journaled in them, that his plan this summer is to give each of these Bibles, or one Bible, to each of his grandsons as a gift. Here is a man who is toward the end of his journey, end of his time following and serving Jesus here on earth, and he is committed to not just leaning into the story of individualism that just says, okay, you've made it to the end, just coast. I mean, the story of individualism in our culture is about, okay, you've done your time, now just sit back, relax, do your thing. No, rather, Pastor Ray has this vision of like, what does it mean for me to take the wisdom, to take all of what God has shown me, the own personal experience that I have received of God's own faithfulness and pass that, funnel that on to the next generation. And for you in this room, if that's you, question for you is simple. What are you passing on? What are you giving to the next generation? Or is there this temptation to want to just lean into that story of individualism, that story that just says, I'm just going to coast and think about my own comfort and my own kind of pleasure in these latter years. Perhaps the spirit and the power of the gospel is inviting you to see there's, that there's something more to give. That actually, if assuming that you have been faithfully following Jesus and growing in maturity over the decades, I want to say you have some of the best wisdom to offer that you have some of the best insight to pass on to people like me. And that people like me, we need faithful, mature, godly men and women to give their best 
to those coming behind. And to not settle for the narrative of individualism in our culture that says just coast and think about yourself. But second, let me speak to those that are perhaps closer to my age. Someday, by God's grace, we'll be 70, 80, or 90. And so the question for people like me is, who are you becoming? What kind of person are you becoming? Again, the culture of individualism says just live for yourself, do your own thing, self-achievement, self-worth, self-identity, all those sorts of things. But the gospel has something better. Because of the Father's blessing, there's something better on offer. David Brooks, author and columnist for the New York Times, talks about two really important sets of virtues. The first set of virtues he talks about are resume virtues. Resume virtues are those that are about all about the culture of individualism. You know, what you can achieve, what you, how much money you make, what performance you have, all of the accolades that are kind of all outward facing. Resume virtues. And the culture of individualism loves resume virtues. But the other kind of virtue that Brooks talks about, he calls eulogy virtues. And eulogy virtues are the, the things that we actually talk about at someone's funeral. You know, I've never been to a funeral where the officiant gets up and says, oh, this, this man or this woman was amazing. I mean, they made billions of dollars. They had thousands of followers on Instagram. Like, we don't say those things at a funeral. Rather, we say things like, so-and-so was incredibly present and near and comforting. It's more about character. It's more about the kind of person that that person is. And so for someone that's perhaps in my kind of age demographic, who are you becoming? Because let me say this, because I think our best years are not in our 30s. Our best years are going to be in our 60s and our 70s by God's grace if we are focused on growing in love and joy and peace and patience and the fruit of the Spirit. What are we living for? And what will we have to pass on? Psalm 71 says this, So even to old age and gray hairs, O God, do not forsake me until I proclaim your might to another generation, your power to all those to come. See, friends, all of us long for the fatherly blessing. In Christ Jesus, we get the Father's blessing. And like Jacob, we're called to pass it on. Father, we're grateful for the chance to be together. We're thankful for the work that you've done on our behalf. And so Jesus, we're reminded, we're reminded of how much we do not deserve your grace and your mercy. We're reminded that despite the fact that we don't deserve your love and your kindness, that, God, you have blessed us more than we can really imagine. And so, God, I pray that you would help each of us, wherever we might be at, you would help us to see and to receive and to delight in the reality, in the good news that we are, we have the Father's blessing, that we are loved and adored by you. And so, God, would you stir our affections? Would you stir our longing for more of you? And would that overflow into just this desire to want to see more people know you and love you? Give us a vision of what it means to become more and more like Christ. And may we pass that on to the coming generations. We love you, we thank you, and we pray these things in your name. Amen.